a warm welcome. I welcome you all to Pune International Center and Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics much awaited annual post budget discussion. Let me begin by welcoming our speakers and the chair of discussion Dr. Ajit Ranade, Dr. Rupa Rege, Professor Sanjay Basu, Sri Prashant Girbani, Professor Hari and Professor Pradeep Apte. We indeed honor to have you with us today these illustrious personalities to share the analysis of the union budget that was presented in the parliament on Tuesday July 23 by honorable union finance minister ms sita raman a brief introduction uh, of our speakers today who are all representing gokhale institute and pic and institutional partners uh, dr rupa rege nisure worked as the group chief economist and the group executive council member at the lnt finance during march 2015 to march 2024 in in this role she was responsible for advert advising and guiding the lnt finance board top management and business heads on the outlook related to various microeconomic and policy issues uh, she majorly contributed to strategic business planning treasury management fundraising and risk planning by providing timely business leads macro calls and early warning signals her key areas of specialization have been macroeconomics and financial intermediaries prior to joining lnt finance she held the position of chief economist and general manager at bank of baroda Uh, from 2003 to 2015, and senior economist at ICICI, DFI, and ICICI Bank from 1989 to 2003. Welcome, ma'am. She is also our alumni. Uh, so, welcome, ma'am. Uh, professor Sanjay Basu is a professor, National Institute of Bank Management, and IBM Pune. He holds MSc degree in economics from Calcutta University. Fellow IMM Calcutta. Uh, his areas of expertise are fixed income portfolio management, market risk management, asset liability management. uh applied control theory game theory uh welcome sir shri prashant girbane director general at maratha chamber of commerce industries and agriculture mccia shri girbane is a director on the board of mcci auto cluster development and research institute and mcci electronic cluster foundation he is a member of a council management of mvi rdc world trade centered a member of the board of management of symbiosis international in university uh at pune international center uh, shri girbane is a trustee and serve as a honorary general secretary uh, mr girbane is b in chemical engineering from ud city and uh, hold mba from imm amdavad mr girbane participated in management development program conducted by oxford university mit sloan welcome sir uh, professor k s hari is a professor at gokhale institute he teaches the core courses of public public economics development economics and elective courses on political economic of indian india's development at the institute his areas of research interest are development economics and specialty in a labor and employment in india skilling human development and economic growth financing of human development and regional economic development he works on several funded research project at the institute uh, one is his collaboration with the, the london school of economics and iit kanpur uh, on the futuristic ecosystem of digital entrepreneurship working in the area of knowledge economy he is exploring the human capital aspect in the fintech industry as a part of this project the other funded by the De department of economics and statistics government of maharashtra and exploring ways to update the methodology of estimation of district domestic product welcome sir professor pradeep apte is a council member of indian council of social science research icssr government of india and former professor of emeritus at savitribai phule pune university he serves as a visiting faculty at a numerous academic and corporate institution including ferguson college pune icci training institute the institute of management development and research symbiosis institute of business management world trade center his areas of expertise are operational research econometrics international trade public finance taxation and agriculture economics to name a few welcome sir Now today's chairperson is a Dr. Ajit Ranade, Vice Chancellor of Gokhale Institute and Politics and Economics. He was the Chief Economist of the Aditya Birla Group, based in Mumbai. He is a PhD in Economics from Brown University and an alumni of both IIT Mumbai and IIM Ahmedabad. Dr. Ranade has a past served as a professor at both Ikrear and IGDR. He is a member of National Executive Committee, FICI, and Economic Policy Council (CII). He chairs the Research Advisory Panel of Indian Institute of Banking and Finance. He is a member of Board of Governance of Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He is a columnist with the Mumbai Mirror. He is also writer at, at First Post, Business Standard, and the Economic Times. He is a co-founder and trustee of Association of Demo Democratic Reforms, which is an Indian civil society group, uh, vying transparency in the politics of India. A warm welcome once again. please give a big round of applause to our chair and panelist we are delighted that 
you could all be here with us today. And now, with, uh, without further any ado, I hand over to Dr. Ranade. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vishal, uh, for the very rapid fire introduction. So can I please request you to really warmly welcome our panelists. <laughs> we really have an excellent panel. Uh, and uh, as usual, by the way, for those of you who don't know, this is the ninth time we are doing this. And this time, this event, post-budget analysis, is jointly being hosted in Gokhale Institute, of course. And the hosts are Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, along with National Institute of Banking and uh, Bank Management. Uh, Dr. Basu represents that. And of course, uh, Pune International Center, and shall I say, Maratha Chamber, uh, uh, Mr. Girbani is here. And uh, we also have our own faculty, uh, Professor Hari and Professor Apte. But most importantly, I'm very happy and delighted to welcome Dr. Rupa Rege Nitsure, newcomer to our fresh, re, freshly settled, resettled in Pune, but actually an alumnus of Gokhale Institute. So second applause to her, please. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't know, maybe one of your, uh, uh, I mean, early PhD students from, of, uh, of uh, Dr. Vivek Debroy, I think. M. Phil. M. Phil, okay. So we, we have, uh, she's, uh, she's a student of our uh, chancellor, Dr. Vivek Debroy. So we are very happy to have Dr. Rupa here. Uh, the format, as you know, is that each of the panelists will speak for about uh, requesting the panelists to please observe that discipline, about 12 minutes, so that we have enough time for an interaction, Q&A. We are now today on 31st of July, so eight days have passed, and reams and dozens and thousands of pages of newsprint uh, you had a chance to go through. So uh, hopefully now the task is to somewhat demystify and talk in terms of a little more in-depth, otherwise the next day's fresh headlines is always Oh, tax bada ki ni bada, income tax. Another interesting tidbit is that they always, since we are in a room full of economists, the first thing, uh, one of the first things that people look at is, what is the fiscal deficit? So normally they say 4.9%. But what is it, 4.9% of what? So 4.9% of something, the fiscal deficit is 4.9% of what? Of GDP, what GDP, nominal or real GDP? It's nominal GDP. But in the entire budget speech or in the budget documents, actually there is never, uh, I mean, with due respect to Professor Apte because he's our Guruji here, I don't think, you know, there is an, uh, actually the budget making is not about pro forecasting GDP. But the number we talk about is the percent of GDP. So therefore, implicit in that discussion and documents is this number called nominal GDP of India next year. So there is a hidden number called what is the forecasted GDP for next year, that is 24, 25. We are now in July, by the way. This budget should have been presented on the 1st of February before the financial year starts. But because of elections, uh, we actually had an interim budget uh, uh, you know, rep presented to parliament, but this is the real budget. And this is the first, so, so, first budget of so-called the Modi 3.0 government. And this time, because of the electoral outcome, uh, we expected, because the BJP did not get an absolute majority in the Lok Sabha, uh, as you know, the budget has to be passed only by the Lok Sabha. The Rajya Sabha has nothing to do about budget pa passing the budget or uh, finance bill. So since the BJP does not have an absolute majority, it was expected at least there will be some adjustment, some coalition uh, kind of pressures that will be seen, and not surprisingly, uh, the two major partners of in the NDA have got something, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar, but we'll, we'll come to that during the discussion. Um, so this was the first uh, budget, uh, budget presentation by the three point, Modi, Modi 3.0, the third outing of our Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And therefore, you know, there was some expectation. Whether those expectations were met or whether it was, uh, expectations were managed or not, I think our panelists will let you know or it will come in a discussion. I just want to leave uh, with just one or two numbers. Uh, be, uh, I don't want to take too much time. So when I said it's 4.9% of what? So the nominal GDP next year, as you work backwards, is a very modest assumption of 10.5% growth. And if you reduce 3, 4% of inflation, then GDP growth rate is only 6%, or, you know, because aspiration is 8. And uh, in, interestingly, uh, expenditure is growing only by 8%. So GDP will grow at 10.5%. Expenditure of the government at 48 lakh crores will be only 8% more. But revenue will grow at 11 to 12 percent. Revenue will grow faster than GDP. Expenditure will grow slower than GDP. Therefore, it means there is fiscal discipline. So expenditure is being slowed down. Revenues are optimistically, there's more revenue collection. And uh, that is fiscally, it's a good news. Also, if you look at revenues, they consist of two major things, tax revenue and uh, non-tax revenue. 
एंड एवरीबडी ऑफकोर्स इज वेरी डिसमेड कि टैक्स रेवन्यू में कुछ नहीं किया मिडिल क्लास इज अपसेट बट द टैक्स रेवन्यू इज एक्चुअली गोइंग अप ओनली बाई इलेवन परसेंट जस्ट बेरली एट द स्पीड ऑफ जी डी पी इफ जी डी पी इज ग्रोइंग शो शो शू टैक्स रेवन्यू ओनली इलेवन परसेंट बट इफ 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 टोटल रेवन्यूज आर ग्रोइंग बाई सम फिफ्टीन परसेंट वेर इज इट कमिंग फ्रॉम इट्स नॉन टैक्स रेवन्यू वॉट इज दिस नॉन टैक्स रेवन्यू वी विल फाइंड आउट बट दिस ईयर द पास्ट ईयर अ मेजर कॉम्पोनेंट ऑफ नॉन टैक्स रेवन्यू was uh, reserve bank of india's 2.1 trillion rupees of dividend now reserve bank of india is supposed to conduct monetary policy but reserve bank of india gave 2.1 trillion rupees ka check to central government should we call it fiscal policy or monetary policy i'm just raising some questions that i do you know being a chair i can go on and on but so therefore the non tax revenue is 37% increase next year anyway so uh, the sequence for the for the session is we will begin with a broad macro picture from dr rupa rege followed by the the fiscal and the public finance math uh, by professor hari then followed by uh, the special because we have seen some special focus on msme skilling and training uh, from mr girbane then followed by uh, professor pradeep apte and then concluding in on finance and banking by uh, dr sanjay basu and then we will open up for q and a and then so we want to wrap everything up in 90 minutes so with your cooperation and cooperation of panelists so we start off over to you dr ruba thank you and good evening everybody it's always a pleasure to uh, come to your alma mater and speak only thing i'm feeling a bit odd because i'm used to sitting that side and not this side but with that difference because uh, vishal has set a good example of uh, you know covering everything in a rapid fire kind of uh, sequence so let me not uh, waste much time um, at the outset um, coming back to the budget i think uh, the macro backdrop of this budget was very favorable uh, we had uh, you know the mood about india was quite positive optimistic because four consecutive years of 7% uh, percent plus growth uh, and uh, RBI has done phenomenal job in controlling inflation uh, of course food shocks uh, the you know they are contributing to slow down in the disinflation process but core inflation which is a demand pull component of inflation is controlled quite well and now it's uh, hovering uh, near 3.5% which we had not seen in decades so uh, that is definitely an achievement our external sector is eminently managed uh, current account deficit uh, you know less than 1% of uh, gdp nominal gdp uh, itself uh, is a uh, good achievement when your exports actually are not doing well so uh, point is that that uh, you know uh, there there were not uh, any serious stresses uh, balance sheets of corporate sector banks were uh, quite healthy at least we didn't have any major uh, episode <clears throat> of uh, uh, excessive financial stress before the budget so i think they made good uh, uh, use of this opportunity and fiscal goals were very clearly defined and there was also what i like best about this budget is that there was a clear acceptance of the weaknesses and pressure points like uh, increased unemployment vulnerability of agriculture sector to uh, you know climate uh, related risks and growing non competitiveness of our manufacturing sector uh, or exporting sector because uh, uh, you know this is certainly comforting to know that finance ministry is uh, taking a pre budget uh, consultative process very seriously and at least for the first time there was an acknowledgement that these uh, structural problems exist and uh, there has to be solutions coming from the fiscal policy arena as uh, dr anade said uh, the biggest comfort came to this year's budget was the uh, buffer uh, given by rbi's uh, dividend to the government because in the interim uh, budget also they had expected uh, rbi's dividend along with uh, public sector banks dividend to be around rupees 1 trillion uh, as against that they got extra 1.2 trillion which was definitely you know which gave them higher fiscal space and another thing for which i think i would give credit to uh, the current uh, finance minister is that very systematically she is uh, reducing uh, spending on subsidies the major subsidies like fertilizers food and petroleum so there also that curtailment uh, was done so this buffer and lower subsidy bill they were optimally used 
for balancing fiscal consolidation targets alongside some welfare spending, social welfare spending. But you know what was discomforting is that there was still haziness uh, about the fiscal glide path beyond the year FY26. Because, uh, you know, if we look at the actual performance of the government on fiscal consolidation front, now we are more or less confident that uh, the medium term target of 4.5% of GDP will be attained by year FY26. But what after that? Because we are reducing fiscal deficit not for sake of it, but because we are suffering from huge public debt. Today, you know, the general government debt is around 85.6% of the GDP. So, uh, point is that, that uh, you know, as per uh, the, this year's budget, during FY25, the government expects central government debt to settle at 56.8% of GDP. And the FRBM committee review, which was done in 2017, it had stipulated that government has to reach 40% of uh, 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 debt target. The central government's debt should be 40% of GDP. And uh, if you look at the present growth rates and the present investment rates, etc., uh, you know, it may take over a decade for us to get, get to that level of 40% from 58%. And this is only for central government. We also have to look at the debt position of the state governments. You, if you add to that, and that's why our general debt is 85%, and that is a real worry. So personally, I feel that we need, the government needs to design a transparent and rule-based fiscal framework, both for the central and state governments. Like RBI came out with a rule-based framework called inflation targeting, so that they define the target and, you know, even though it was flexible inflation targeting, we at least, you know, it made the whole exercise of monetary policy making more predictable. Today, there is a lot of haziness as to how India will achieve 40% of uh, debt target beyond FY26, what is going to be the roadmap, glide map, and for that, as Dr. Anade said, what are the projections? For the projections for real GDP growth, inflation, investment rates, etc. So there is absolutely no clarity on that. And more is that, when I said that it will take a decade, there also I'm making an assumption that there will not be any big black swan event in the next decade. If that happens, like COVID kind of uh, pandemic coming from health sector or global financial crisis coming from the financial sector, I mean, then all, uh, you know, calculations and uh, projections will go haywire. So this is a serious concern and uh, we need to develop that. Also, you know, uh, Another thing is that the real worry at the macroeconomic front or macrofinancial, uh, uh, which has posed a risk to my macrofinancial stability of the country is that, that the net financial savings of the household sector is today at 5.3% of GDP. This is at its 50 years low. And if you look at the Reserve Bank of India latest statistics that is uh, released in the Financial Stability Review, it clearly shows that household sector is, you know, their total liability share in the GDP is growing and the savings uh, share in GDP is continuously coming down. So uh, today you see the support to investment is coming from government's capex support. Uh, Pre-pandemic time, the government's capex as a percentage of total uh, expenditure, budgeted expenditure, used to be less than 13%. For last two, three years, it is 23%. They have made, they have really uh, raised the bar. But private capex revival has still not happened. Uh, we are seeing the signs of uh, private capex revival only in those industries which have very strong uh, linkages to infrastructure sectors, but we are not still seeing a broad-based revival of private capex. Now, just imagine a situation if 
to finance its capital expenditure if the government is borrowing at the present pace and we don't have sufficient pool of our own domestic savings. When the private sector uh, capex sentiment will revive, from where will the money come? That means both the government as well as the private sector will have to increase its borrowings from overseas markets, which will increase you know, uh, risks to external sector management. So point is that we also need, I want at this stage the government to define a clear roadmap for debt reduction by making you know, realistic projections for the overall investment rate within that the private investment rate and what are their ideas about the avenues for financing these investment requirements. There is no clarity on that. So far, uh, you know, but of course, you know, it, for the near term picture is definitely encouraging. From interim budget also, they have reduced fiscal deficit to GDP ratio by 20 bips. Uh, borrowing estimates, the government's borrowing estimates are also broadly similar to what they had defined in interim budget around uh, rupees 14 trillion in gross terms. So this should support the bond market uh, demand supply dynamics uh, because now India is attracting a lot of foreign inflows in its uh, debt instruments because now our government bonds have become part of the sovereign bond index, you know, JP Morgan as well as Bloomberg uh, index. That is a recognition uh, uh, for our bond market. So I expect this positive momentum to continue in the near term and uh, there could be a rating upgrade uh, down the road. Uh, lower uh, fiscal deficit alongside lower uh, current account deficit and uh, headline CPI number approaching its target level, they augur well for rupee stability also. Last two years we have seen that RBI has done excellent job uh, on the uh, on managing uh, 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 rupee stability without too much of intervention our forex cover has improved to uh, us dollar uh, 670 billion that's because they have uh, you know very uh, because of their timely interventions not just in the spot markets but also in the forward markets so that there isn't too much stress on the exchange rate so our exchange rate has hovered between 82.50 to 83.50. And given the current mix of all these macro variables, I don't think there will be much pressure on rupee vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, other competitive currencies. But of course, you know, India may continue to attract a lot of debt inflows for uh, 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 foreign investors. And, you know, that ideally should put upward uh, create upward bias in rupee, but that may not happen because there were concerns of uh, export competitiveness. Our inflation is still much higher than the inflation in our trading partners. So I think Reserve Bank of India will intervene in such a way that it will cap the appreciation of rupee. But you know, the stability of INR and the downside bias in long-term interest rates, they augur well uh, for uh, overall investment sentiment. Another major thing, and it is part of my terms of reference, so I will cover, it is about the employment. The new initiative taken uh, by the government, employment-linked incentives, it, it has three components. But point is that, you know, these are again in the form of giving some nominal or financial support, like uh, direct cash benefit transfers or contributions to EPO, FO, et cetera, provident fund. Uh, supporting employee, uh, employers, etc. How it will create employment on a sustainable basis is not clear. Because what really matters is the employment elasticity of growth uh, in non-farm sectors. Because we have surplus uh, labor in the farm sector, we want that to get absorbed in the non-farm sector. But these kind of measures have to be supplemented with um, specialized training and skilling for those people to s remain employable. Otherwise, you know, it will, it will just be a temporary kind of uh, solution. And this problem becomes critical because of the advent of uh, AI and digitalization. Uh, because of that, you know, already the absorption of labor per unit of output has come down. 
so yeah so if that 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 uh, uh, that concern is not addressed at all so i don't know how this will um, help and the last thing is that which is the positive about the budget is that the budget has given a clear, clear signal that excessive protectionism may come to an end because the finance minister's speech clearly said export competitiveness was our aim and uh, this was reflected in some of their concrete proposals also because she reduced uh, customs duty on more than 50 products and they are all uh, components of you know uh, electronic equipments renewable energy equipments etc so and there is also a promise that they will take a comprehensive review of the rate structure before the next budget to rationalize and simplify it for the ease of trade now this is very strongly positive for exports because these suggestions were made uh, because I think in 2018 uh, they became overtly protectionist under uh, Atmanirbhar uh, uh, concept and lot of uh, trade restrictions were imposed, uh, tariff as well as non-tariff barriers. Now they are looking at it positively is a good sign. So to uh, cut the long story short, they have made very good uh, use of the uh, favorable macro backdrop. Uh, budget is definitely in the right direction in terms of its thrust and policies, but uh, performance budgeting is equally important because that alone will show that uh, you know the actual spending has matched the planned expenditures. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupa. So macro stability. At the end of the first speaker, the score is 1-0 in favor of the government. <laughs> Professor Hari. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ranade, and uh, for giving me this opportunity in this evening. So, uh, most of the things I want to talk here is basically on the fiscal consolidation because we have divided the core theme in such a way that I have to speak on fiscal parameters. So, once you look at the fiscal, uh, because I do have some uh, kind of reservations when we talk about the growth of the economy because uh, of late we are upbeat with the stories with uh, regard to India's growth. But uh, I always believe that we have to look at the level also because unless we look at the level, growth also doesn't uh, make much uh, to the story because growth is a necessary condition but it's not a sufficient for us in the sense that we are still about to reach that uh, 4 trillion or 5 trillion mark where the other countries uh, which are slowing down is uh, around uh, 20 trillion or above. So when we talk about India's growth, the pace at which we are growing may not be sufficient to reach the larger target of the developed country which we are aiming in the 2047. So this speed may not be that sufficient to reach there. We are just, uh, maybe we are in a country where there uh, we used to have some stories. No, so. We used to have a story where there no, no, nobody is having nose in a country and one person is uh, having nose, so he become the king of that country. So like that, nobody is growing in the world, so suddenly India has uh, recorded, because if you look at the global paradigm, you can see there is a three percentage uh, on an average countries are growing, where majorities of the countries are uh, finding it difficult to pick up in the post-COVID scenario. So it is in this context that this budget has come because uh, this, uh, even in the finance minister's first statement itself, she has acknowledged that there is a global uncertainty that is uh, there, plus there is an inflation pressure that is uh, there even still today in the economy from the macro, these monetary policy committees, uh, frequent sittings and the uh, rate of interest is an indication of that because there is a continuous uh, high level of uh, rate of interest in the economy for a very long period of time. So that itself is an indication that uh, there is a kind of a supply side or a structural kind of an inflation. When you talk about the demand side inflation we may, may have successfully able to control, that is where sometimes monetary policy I feel that is failed to uh, address the kind of issues at that point of time. It is in this context that uh, fiscal consolidation becomes uh, very important because India, because they, I don't want to repeat what Madam has already 
mentioned about india's growth story we are around say on an average growing around 8 percentage with a clear uh, stack means uh, slow down in the agricultural sector followed by a better performance in industry and of course there is a continuous stagnation we can see if you look at from a long term perspective from say 2011 12 series if you see and compare it with the previous uh, period when the because he is talking about the modi 3 regime so if you compare with the two regimes uh, that manmohan singh 2 1 and 2 so you can clearly see that there is a clear uh, slow down of the growth rate in the indian economy so we have to compare it from a larger long term perspective so if you look at the fiscal consolidation the uh, theoretical perspective on it is that we have to have a long term perspective because we have been eyeing our we have been having this objective for a long time since the implementation of frbm itself we have been eyeing for this flow concept so what is different in this budget i could see is that we are going to hit now the stock concept also because normally we used to look at the fiscal deficit which is a flow in that particular year now we are going to hit at the other one also it is in the sense that uh, stock itself needs to be reduced so we will be in a better position because this is warranted basically because of the kind of uh, fiscal deficit the union government because we have to be very particular when speaking about the fiscal deficit again because the states uh, somehow have been successfully except say if you take 29 state except four five states if you take an on an average you can see that states on an average has been in a better managers maybe because of the kind of uh, restrictions they have on the borrowing limit and other restrictions states as a whole has been a better performance when uh, it comes to the fiscal consolidation and the union the leader has always been lagging behind when it comes to the fiscal consolidation and uh, this is uh, just clear from the graph itself and you can see the interest payment if you take the revenue of a say 100 rupee 35 rupees immediately goes as the interest payment so you can uh, imagine what is left with the government for uh, investment it has been stagnant you can see 40 percentage to 37 percentage over a two decades time is not a significant decline in terms of the uh, payment which we have to make and this has been added by the higher interest rate also because on the other hand we talk about madam has been telling about the competition that can happen in the monetary market this because this has because higher inflation higher interest rate higher payment by the union government this has been a cyclical feature for the union government has for a very long time and if you look at the consolidated debt to gdp ratio it is almost 80 because imf and many countries you can compare it with some of the countries have the capacity as i told in the beginning to repay the debt some countries run around say more than 100 percentage also into debt to gdp ratio so we cannot go to that level basically because of the specific rigidities or the structural problems this economy is having so that we one has to highlight and it is in this context that uh, luckily this uh, finance this budget has made a bold initiative in terms of at least uh, acknowledging that there is a problem of the long term problem it has been acknowledged immediately after the covid and this budget has uh, luckily has taken it uh, forward because i just try to look at econometrically how this uh, sustainability issue is going to happen because two possibilities are there for to sustain any debt no you have to either increase the growth rate and have a higher gdp so that denominator is high proportion will come down automatically otherwise you have to bring down your interest rate so these two cushions are only available to the economy so these two are not that favorably performing that is why we are not in a position because we cannot curtail the expenditure because expenditure compression beyond a point is not possible in any developing country because that will be counterproductive only if you talk about the reduction of the public expenditure beyond a limit it will not facilitate further growth because we have not that raise reach that stage where we cannot withdraw from that kind of uh, public expenditure but off late you can see a tendency 
if you look at the total expenditure, this becomes even more clear. You can see a significant uh, shrinking of the budget itself as a proportion of it. Maybe size of the budget is increasing. But as a proportion of GDP, if you take, then this uh, capital expenditure story becomes uh, even more critical. Because if you talk, talk about the, as a percentage of GDP, you can see that though there is an improvement, of course we have to admit that, but we failed to reach at the 2004-05 level. If you look at the beginning of this, uh, this thing, we failed to reach at that old level where we were, because that was the India's golden period, what we call it as the 2004-05 onwards. No, so we have not reached at that peak level of uh, public investment. So at least significantly there is an improvement, there is a shift in uh, terms of uh, fiscal management, in terms of reducing the fiscal deficit, in terms of revenue deficit, revenue expenditure and increasing the capital expenditure. Here one more thing which I found uh, interesting, I will take only two minutes, uh, about the budget is that he, she has emphasized that there needs to be more nudging for the state government to spend on capital expenditure. Here I would like to submit before this audience, because many of you are uh, connected with the government of Maharashtra also. So I would uh, submit that some of the state government who have that uh, fiscal space available, because some of the states fiscal deficit, if you look at, you know, some of the larger states like Maharashtra, which if you look at the growth rate of Maharashtra, clearly there is a downward spiral, that the downward direction Maharashtra is going. So in that context, if we can recommend for a better capital expenditure coming from the state government, because I do believe that if you talk about the larger country, India as a federation has to grow. Growth should, uh, because that emphasis needs to come from the federal unit also. It is not that everything union government can do. You need to have a stronger state support or the lower levels of government or wherever possibilities are there, you should not spend, uh, I mean, I am not against, uh, because I am coming from a welfare state, I am not against any welfare programs, but uh, you are other, because recently uh, in the Maharashtra government budget also you can see so many soaps coming because it's an election year. But I would uh, recommend that we should, uh, uh, means nudge the state, central government should come up with, uh, there is a fund, capital expenditure fund, that needs to be expanded in such a way that that motivates the state government also to contribute towards the capital expenditure. So if you look at this, this quickly, if you look at the increase, what happened in the budget is very interesting. Because uh, out of the, say, 3.96 additional expenditure, 3.96 lakh, 1 lakh immediately goes as interest payment. 1 lakh crores immediately goes as the interest payment and rest goes to the centrally sponsored schemes and other things. And uh, surprisingly, the tax to GDP ratio more or less remains the constant. Because we have not been able to significantly improve except, uh, say, GST, which is going to be, again, a different uh, question altogether in a uh, developed country, whether you should have more direct taxes or indirect taxes, because that is also a welfare affecting, because you know how regressive means uh, GST is in terms of the consumer and uh, over and above how if you focus more on direct uh, taxes, what is the advantage of that from the uh, means equity point of view. So from that perspective, we should have moved because we want to become a developed country, then your fiscal policy should be in line with that objective of being in the developed country. So that I feel that we need to have more focus on the fiscal consolidation, this thing, and uh, we have to be ready for more shocks. Because now monetary policy is uh, ready for different shocks, as Madam told. Our fiscal policy should also be made in such a way that we should be able to absorb the short-term or long-term shocks that comes into the economy. So we should, uh, because 15th Finance Commission has recommended even a fiscal council to be set up to coordinate between the union government and state governments. So I hope that such an arrangement will come sooner than later to consolidate the budget because uh, consolidate basically the fiscal roadmap 
and of course we have to have a roadmap beyond 26 if you are talking about the long term growth of the economy we need to have a long term perspective now being an investor i should know what the tax i am going to pay in the year 2030 at least indicative it is not the exact the rate but i should uh, be having an indication which uh, road the economy is going so that indication sometimes uh, needs to be given because even nda may not be there or you, or any other coalition can come but we teach, students of economics always believe government stay there no because government is something which is going to be static there so government needs to have a long term road map on fiscal policy okay. which will uh, of course uh, help in the long term perspective of uh, growth and consolidation of debt and our ultimate target of course will be 40 percentage debt at the union government and states of course have been cooperating now their consolidated i checked the figure is 25 percentage so i think they, they are more or less on the road to reach that 20 percentage target so even incrementally we can reach that target uh, within say another couple of years so but uh, central government you needs to uh, means uh, whatever they promise they have to deliver in terms of fiscal consolidation no? so that will motivate more private investment of course into the economy okay. thank you thank you for this opportunity thank you thank you professor hari thank you so a couple of things that came out i just want you to remember he mentioned the very high burden of interest rates almost 42% of revenues go to playing paying, paying only interest rate interest on the debt and the other thing he mentioned very uh, not many people actually probably uh, have appreciated that while we talk about the fiscal stress on the central government a large state like maharashtra is actually underspending in fact there is plenty of unutilized fiscal space in fact if i'm not mistaken 50000 crores of spare cash is lying with uh, with the maharashtra government so there is this uh, dichotomy that uh, at the central government level there is fiscal stress or overstretch but at uh, large states like maharashtra are underspending so we'll come back to these issues uh, may i invite now uh, uh, mr girbani thank you professor ranade i think having heard about the uh, macro the fiscal i'll try specifically talk about msmes i'll try talk about uh, what msmes are what's covered in the budget and also what's not covered in the budget that should have been talked about <coughs> my colleague sent me a message and i was looking at this uh, about the budget a young colleague uh, who did economics from one of these universities and she says that the budget was 58 pages 14703 words and it mentioned msme 21 times so i said why are you telling me this because she says last year it was half the time and they have given lot of emphasis on this I said all right how about skills she says similar skills is also mentioned lot many more times as compared to last year then i asked her how many times was bihar mentioned and i just wanted to ask one more question right she said five times so anyway msmes and skills was uh, emphasized upon in the budget and hence we'll talk a bit about this but before i come to what's mentioned in the budget just quick couple of minutes on what's msmes that's micro small and medium companies enterprises to simply put it any organization with a turnover less than 250 crore falls in msme how many of those in the country 2016 yeah we are data poor country so we don't have data after that 2016 we said 6.3 crore msmes today maybe 8 10 crore take your pick the number of jobs provided about 11 crore that's the last number recorded contribution to exports 45% contribution to manufacturing about 35% now that would tell us why we should emphasize on msmes so what's covered in the budget but before that what's the challenge of the msmes and then we'll see whether it's covered in the budget or not so bunch of challenges but we'll go back to the basics uh, land labor capital enterprise right factors of production so there are enough things to talk about land enough things to talk about labor part of it will cover in the skills but let's go to capital it's a huge challenge let's put some numbers to it the government of india had put up a uk sinha committee the former sevi chairperson and that committee said 
then about 14 trillion, but now about 18, 19 trillion. That's the size of the formal credit to MSMEs. The missing gap then was about 20, 20 25 trillion. Now let's say about 20 trillion, 18, 20 trillion. That's the missing gap. That's the credit that MSMEs require, but they don't have. Where do they get the capital? I mean, if you don't have equity, you need credit, isn't it? Where do they get that capital? Where do they get that credit from? Informal sources. Of course, you all know this better. Informal sources are difficult to get funding from and very, very expensive. And hence, you would not be competitive in international markets. You would not be competitive even domestically, and hence, you would have a lot of flow coming from all other countries. So the challenge to resolve is credit. The second big challenge is business development, selling more of what they produce. So the first on credit, what did the government of India do or what did this budget do about it? Bunch of things, I'll specifically mention a couple of them. Credit guarantees. During the COVID time, more than one crore MSMEs were saved because of credit guarantees. Because they got the credit guarantee, financial institutions were encouraged to give them credit. And that helped a lot. Encouraged by that, there are more credit guarantees than before in this financial budget, and that's a good thing to have happened. Beyond that, you are aware about the mudra loans. You know about the NPA ratios, low NPA ratios there. The mudra loan limit of Tarun has moved from 10 lakh to 20 lakh, which is a good sign. Again, sticking to credit. You have SIDB as a specialized institution that provides credit to MSMEs, directly, indirectly. So more number of branches coming on the SIDB, again, a good thing to have happened. Beyond all of this, there is a platform called Trades, and they have reduced the limit from 500 to 250 crore there. So I'll have to explain this, it'll take a minute to, to tell you what this is. When a large company does not give money to a small company in time, they're supposed to give in 45 days, by the way. When that doesn't happen, the small company will have to take credit and essentially fund the large company for those many days. Out of the about 18 trillion rupees as the credit gap, about 10.7 trillion rupees is the delayed payments. As in the large company that's supposed to pay to the small company is not paying on time and thus the size of the problem. So to solve the delayed payment, you can do trade discounting. You take that bill, give it to the bank. Bank says, fine, I trust that. Trust that company, and I'll pay you right away. And the interest rate come down to 7 8%. Trades is a wonderful platform supported by RBI and all of that. So the limit was 500 crore. Prime Minister Modi ji talked about this November 2018, that every company above 500 crore should be there on the platform. Very few went there. Those who went there didn't do the trading. Now that limit has come down to 250, that's a good thing. We had asked for it. Is that sufficient? That's another question. So those are the bunch of things done on the credit side for MSMEs. The other thing is business development. As I had mentioned, the 45% of India's exports are contributed by these tiny little companies. Many of these tiny little companies. So to support them, the budget talks about doing export hubs focused on MSMEs. Now, it's a wonderful announcement. We need to see the detail of what it is, right? But if it comes through, that will be a great thing that will happen to support the MSMEs. So far, all the initiatives that you have on exports largely did not differentiate between small company and large company, and hence larger companies kind of were a lot more proactive, smaller companies weren't, and hence they did not get as much benefit, right? So those are the two primary things, credit and business development on MSME. Very quickly on the skills, and then I'll come to what's not covered. On the skills, uh, actually, some of you would have read the economic survey uh, a day before the budget, isn't it? Anyone remember anything on skills there? What was mentioned on skills? What number was mentioned on skills in the economic survey? It's a very prominent number. Hamare desh ko har saal 80 lakh yuvaon ko aapke jese Rozgar ki jarurat hai. Ye kaha gaya tha. 80 lakh. No wonder next day when the budget was presented, 
the finance minister talked about 4.2 crore youth to be supported through an initiative because it goes back to the 80 lakh multiplied by 5 approximately right this is over 5 years so a lot of emphasis on the skills part of it in the budget it also talked about 20 odd lakh people every year getting apprenticeship so it's a good thing but there are certain challenges in implementing it the challenges are it assumes that the organizations have that much of a capacity to part fund because it's not fully funded right part fund it also makes second assumption that the individuals coming are of a certain caliber who could be trained to and taken forward i think those are huge assumptions my appeal to the government and we have written it would be to continue to do the m and &E, the monetary and evaluation part of it on a quarterly basis so that you can make certain changes after taking feedback from the industry and make it work otherwise it is a great announcement next year we'll look at another announcement so that's the thing about the skills part of it last but not the least what's not covered and i should stop there i think on the msme front as i mentioned the best solution is this trades platform for the delayed payment we talked about these numbers right informal credit gap credit gap informal credit about 18 trillion let's say 18 20 trillion 10 trillion is delayed payment the solution is simple every invoice is on the gstn platform connect that gstn platform to the trades platforms every invoice is on gstn platform connect the G trades platform to gstn platform and you can do in a most secure manner because it's already connected in one way or another way because many of the invoices are already paid through it if you do that the government does not have to a produce b finance it just needs to regulate and that also very lightly isn't that the spectrum you all studied or are studying right the ideal thing for government just to do regulate as against produce or finance uh, and that's what it will be able to do and solve substantive part of the 10.7 trillion size problem that's what should have happened hasn't happened hopefully it would happen in one of the acts that the msa development act is supposed to be renewed i'm hoping that will happen there the second part is the budget of msme department itself that's contributing 45 percent of exports one third of the manufacturing the size of that budget is 0.5 percent of the entire expenditure last year it was 21,138 crore if i got that right and year before it was 21,138 crore so there is no change there if you want to increase the state capacity it's an area where you want to increase the state capacity to support it if you don't increase that capacity there how would you support as many of them the last but not the least and it's a generic point it's applicable for any government center state wherever irrespective of which party forms it and that's the monitoring and evaluation bit of it it's a wonderful thing when you go to the budget right some of us look at these numbers the macro numbers some of us look at what tax benefit i'm going to get many of us because much of the budget part is about announcements right uh mahilaon ke liye ye kiya gaya garibon ke liye wo kiya gaya iske liye wo kiya irrespective of which government it is right and we are just lost in all of those announcements and there is no way to track those last year ke announcement humne sun liye some of us go to the media talk about this they cover it the media people have another news next day we have another thing to worry about next day then don't know what happened to the last year's budget ab agle saal ka budget ka agla karyakram hoga तो उसमें यही चर्चा करेंगे इस साल क्या हो गया आई थिंक इट्स अ सिंपल थिंग राइट वी सॉ दिस वंडरफुल डैशबोर्ड ड्यूरिंग कोविड टाइम सच अ कॉम्प्लेक्स थिंग वाज हैपनिंग इन द कंट्री बट वी कुड ऑल पुट इट टुगेदर द गवर्नमेंट कुड पुट टुगेदर एग्जैक्टली हाउ मेनी पीपल गॉट द वैक्सीन इफ यू कैन डू दैट वाई कैंट यू डू द सिंपल थिंग यू मेड द अनाउंसमेंट विच एवर गवर्नमेंट वेदर सेंटर स्टेट लोकल डजेंट मैटर यू पुट इट ऑन अ सिंपल डैशबोर्ड एंड अपडेट इट वंस अ क्वार्टर इफ यू कैंट डू इट वंस अ मंथ वॉट्स हैपनिंग टू दोज this is what the governments owe to us hopefully some day there will be such a chorus about this that uh, the governments would be compelled to put those uh, dashboards so i hope that happens some day i should stop here thank you so much for the opportunity
Thank you, thank you, Prashant. Thank you very much. As you can see, he's uh, you know, uh, very passionate about this subject. In fact, he's known as Mr. MSME and uh, he's also a technocrat. So he has proposed this solution that he's been working on for a long time. I think we are going to see the light of day about connecting the GSTN network, which is very active now, with the Treads network of RBI. If one, that technical connection happens, I think some of this. Professor Pradeep Apte. Firstly, thank you, Ajit for inviting us for this post-budget halwa. <laughs> I'm usually very reluctant about talking about budget because I think it is useful document, but for the government uh, servants, and much less for other people. As Prashant rightly said, people hear uh, the speech and give reactions, which, is, which are actually reactions about the announcements made and not so much about the budget. So another humble suggestion which I have been making for long, better organize discussion on economic survey rather than organizing it on budgets. Because students would benefit and probably the professors who deliver lectures would also benefit in the course because they would be required to look at it a little more closely. I'm, I'm supposed to speak about agriculture. This is a complex problem because Technically, a very large part of the agriculture is not the responsibility of the state government, uh, is not the responsibility of the union government, it is primarily the state government. Uh, the reason I am mentioning this is that this is not to suggest that therefore union government has nothing to do with it. For whatever variety of historical reasons, union government is very much in the thick of making agriculture related policies. But uh, one important element that you should never ignore is that except for research institutions, affiliated on one or other, maybe agriculture universities, ICR, or whatnot. And a great behemoth created by, uh, histor for historical reasons, by the union government itself called Food Corporation of India. Government of India is very highly indulging in dealing with agricultural matters. The, there are certain parts which uh, cannot be done away with, and there is one very cash there. FCI is a union government body primarily. It is based on union government funding. The so-called farmer's agitation that occurred two years back was primarily driven by the kind of vested interests that have been developed in and around FCI. There was every good chance to break it through the so-called three laws. They could not have been probably broken at one stroke, but over a period that could have withered away. But for whatever its wisdom, Supreme Court kept on allowing that to happen. Thankfully, this year they have prohibited it. Therefore, it may not occur. But at that, ti at that time, <clears throat> there are a number of problems that were raised about FCI. And I thought that there would be some modification to the functioning of the FCI that must happen. In fact, the suggestion had come long back. There was, in fact, Vijay Kalkar led a committee which talked about make the working of the FCI divided into two parts. One which deals with the subsidy is one thing, and one which deals with the operations of the FCI per se in terms of its usual commercial affairs of managing price level and the supplies across country, that should be separated. It seems to be happening, uh, at least in accounting terms. For example, there used to be an entry called subsidy paid to FCI, which has disappeared. It is now shown under one single scheme. So at least the separate accounting head has been made which shows that the subsidy component of the FCI is now separated from it. And all the operations of the FCI, which are usually in terms of the surpluses that are attributed to FCI, which are usually called internal budgetary income, uh, its own uh, resource uh, mobilization, that has been shown separately. What I expected on the basis of what was submitted as the document presented by the Supreme Court appointed committee, which had indicated number of things which probably are the good uh, pointers toward the way in which FCI needs to be reformed. One important point of that is that the operations of the FCI are heavily tilted in favor of certain crops and heavily tilted in favor of certain states. So for example, if you are to apportion the procurement of the FCI across India, across different states, many states are there who produce that crop, but the FCI operation is in fact absent. So correcting for this federal dimension it's something which was, in fact, should have been on cards. Probably it is better not to announce it and start practicing it. 
uh, let me give that concession to the union government that probably they might be aiming for that, but this is something which is necessary. Another pretext which would have been possible for this is that the government of India itself has pro uh, proclaimed a scheme whereby they are the, it goads the state governments to go in favor of procurement of what are called the millets. And that is something which typically will have to be mostly operated by the state government because union government does not have a cozy position in case of millets like go to two or three states and procure whatever that you need. The reason why I'm mentioning this is A, the size of the subsidy that is likely to be there may perhaps be diversified across states and the other states would be beneficiary of the subsidies and the kind of a quota which has been developed around the FCI operation in few states could be broken. Number two, certain kinds of variety of rice which probably need to be included in the public distribution system disbursement don't get collected because the operations there are much, much weaker or even absent. There is one more problem with the concentration of the FCI operations being there in few states and we face it in form of environmental problem. Punjab, which had a very high water table, has been in fact pumping it out for having nearly three successive crops. The last crop being often that of a rice, which is not necessarily a very dominant traditional crop of Punjab. Consequence is you are required to pull out all the residue and burn it. Another consequence is that the continuous operation of the land, uh, use, of, use of the land, results into nature of degrading and water logging, which needs to be prevented in these states. If at all we want to correct for that, partly a problem for Delhi and partly a problem for Punjab, that they must preserve the nature of land that they have with a good water table, less contaminated by whatever other residues. What could be thought of, and in fact we had suggested, I had suggested this long back in Niti Aayog, we should start something what is called in WTO parlance, blue subsidy. That means limitation subsidy. You give subsidy per hectare for not growing a crop. This will naturally reduce the residue. This will also naturally restore the nature of health of the both water as well as the soil. And more importantly, because that output which is getting procured in those concentrated regions will get naturally diversified into another states. So it would be in fact far better to think of this kind of a subsidy which is in fact production limitation subsidy rather than giving them in, in form of an indirect subsidy that we are giving in form of MSP procurement. And this is something which is a workable proposal and that would also partly correct for the nature of imbalance that exists across states when it comes to government intervention. The subsidy happens to be one of the major syndrome which needs to be addressed because all, all of us know taking both uh, state government as well as union government together, water, electricity and of course the so-called subsidization related intervention that we make. Uh, the fertilizer is third element. All these are the elements that need to be curbed. We have been talking of uh, stabilizing the revenue deficit related problem. Part of the revenue deficit problem is in fact perpetual. It is not a very recent creation. In fact, in 86, it was even worse because we used to show part of the capital receipt as a part of the receipts and show it much lower. When that was corrected, the revenue deficit started appearing to be a real cause of concern and it has perpetuated so for 30 years. Part of the reason for why to tap the RBI surplus is because otherwise it's more like an accounting entry. You'd be able to use it for correction that you actually face in form of a revenue deficit. If this is done in a more systematic way, probably it would be possible to at least deal with part of the revenue deficit component which has been self-perpetuating and self-accumulating. Because interest rate is a payment, is a problem because of that. There is also a problem which no one speaks about and probably even the government will never dare to speak about. One of the major reasons why the administrative cost of government of India is increasing is the operation of pay commissions. And this is something which is a more serious problem when it comes to states. So probably postponing next pay commission would be a good, issue, a good kind of a solution. And this is not going to be necessarily causing a huge concern for the people who are employed with the government making great contributions to economic progress. Probably they would be continued to be paid with the kind of a protection that they get in form of the slabs that are present prevailing, as well as the nature of inbuilt protection that they get in form of the DAs that they get. So if you, if you are able to postpone this, that would be another source by which it would be possible to in fact attack the problem of perpetual uh, persistence of the revenue deficits. 
the major thing that i think some of them uh, would mention but i think uh, a remarkable thing that has happened because agriculture has lot of problems and without having something like a real cooperative federalism in terms of sorting out of these issues the solution will keep us eluding us as it happened in case of the three laws they are market reform related laws and that to be scrapped is an unfortunate thing that was also the case with the reforming of the sales taxes and the result reforming of the excise if we could deal something like a gst solution a similar kind of a solution at least item wise should be feasible on the basis of cooperative federalism there is a slight hope that the person who has been dealing with this uh, as a chief minister of madhya pradesh has become an agriculture minister so let us hope that probably something like the nature of market reform which he has actually played with toyed with worked with is likely to push for this but without this the long list of elements that actually agriculture suffers from cannot be so easily tangled tackled because of the union government action the it is primarily the responsibility of the state governments and without involvement of the state government the problem seems more or less unsolvable the one problem which uh, union government handles and talks about in the budget is diffusion of technologies of different sorts right from making the so called targeted uh, subsidy payments or making the targeted delivery of the pds it is talking about in terms of digital uh, kind of a connection use of technology there is also a great amount of union government support for doing a very critical but very complex kind of a uh, implementation of data when it comes to providing data for what is called the krushi bima yojana because there are no real credible data that are available to decide what should be the level level of compensation what should be the loss how much it should be reimbursed in form of against the premium set etc etc so in this sense if the union government is trying that there is another factor which has been recently cropped up in this budget explicitly look at the what technological I suppose 16, 17, and 17, 18. When Arvind Subramanian was the economic advisor, he wrote a chapter on whether it would be possible to go to what is called non-conventional energy of sources like solar power. No mention of, no great deal of emphasis on nuclear power. This is something which has happened in this budget, which I think is a great thing to and it augurs well. because it is talking of the nature of technology which is being practiced now world over where having what are what are technical called smr let's believe it is something like a compact nuclear reactor which you can be installed probably as it happened in case of isro you will find the rural uh, roads being uh, carrying this and the uh, installation would happen as a result of this the nature of energy resources that are required to be invested in the traditional forms of energy generation if they happen in this form a number of technological uh, innovations can be more easily and extensively diffused in the rural areas and that would usher in the way for what can be called as a new precision based agriculture which is going to be in fact the future of agriculture there is another problem which again union government is involved making the cadastral survey the land plots and their entitlements we are not yet in the stage of giving for example an entitlement certificate for each of the plot but when that happens then making a land as a very easily tradable resource both for the short as well as long term would be a feasibility without that it can never happen so more the money and more the speed with which the union government persuades its own machinery as well as state government machineries to complete this it would be possible to rethink of the kind of land tenancy related regulations and the rules as well as the acts that we had installed way back in 1940s and 50s unless these are implemented the possibility of reforming the land market which is the most critical market for the reformation of agriculture will not occur and therefore the if one wants to reap the technological benefits with the advancement of a technology now supported perhaps potentially by relatively cheaper energy like for example having a refrigerated container was used to be a dream for number of exporters from agriculture you can have that kind of a refrigeration for the whatever warehouse storage that you are going to conceive in terms of hamlet of villages if you want these things to happen then it is necessary that we also undertake these reforms whereby investing in agriculture becomes as attractive as it could be in other sectors 
अदरवाइज इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एग्रीकल्चर इज पॉसिबल ओनली फॉर दोज फ्यू हु प्रॉबली फॉर वराइटी ऑफ रीजन इंक्लूडिंग इनकम टैक्स रीजन कैन शो एन इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एग्रीकल्चर एंड इफ यू वॉन्ट इफ यू लुक एट द वे इन विच इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एग्रीकल्चर दैट इज वॉट इज इन सी एस ओ पार्लेंस कैपिटल फॉर्मेशन इन एग्रीकल्चर why is it stagnant and why is it declining that is precisely because there are number of obstacles which have been created by the legacy of policies that we have created so all, overhauling all of these and making uh, getting them rid of it it's something which is a pathway which has to be pursued but evidently you can't expect it in one budget and one budget document but at least the mention of this has been found in the economic survey so i hope next time we'll be then discuss about economic survey than the budget which is otherwise not such a serious matter for the economy oh, as well great thank you professor apte thank you <laughs> as you can see we uh, in our pose budget analysis we give a great treat if not a halwa it's actually a snack uh, i am not going to ask a, a poll question to this audience whether you are against a pay commission so we'll do that later uh, and agriculture as you said is actually a state subject so uh, you can't uh, deny that a lot of action comes in the state so our last speaker is uh, professor sanjay basu on finance and banking good evening esteemed uh, vice chancellor sir distinguished panelists it is a matter of immense pleasure and privilege for me to represent nibm on this august panel i'll keep my comments short and focused next slide okay so i feel humbled to comment on msb credit in the presence of an acclaimed expert but i shall take my punt uh then i throw some light on trends in market borrowing and conclude with capital gains tax and securities transaction tax so this is what you will have self financing msb these are budget announcements self financing msme credit guarantee scheme so there will be an upfront guarantee and annual guarantees right with a guarantee up to 100 crores the loan amount can be higher credit support during stress period new assessment portal for msme credit yes thank you now where did this idea of credit guarantees come from right there was cgt msc that was operational but the main thrust was this the success i would say the spectacular success of this project emergency credit line guarantee scheme so ncgtc national credit guarantee trust corporation which sponsored the scheme came to nibm twice first at the onset of the program and uh, that was in july 2020 and second just before it wanted to wind up the scheme that was in 2023 right so this was a flagship scheme this has appeared yes fine thank you am i audible with or without the mic i think i'm audible yes so the eclgs right has increased commercial bank credit during the pandemic phase this was introduced in may 2020 right it has also reduced the cost of credit to the borrowers right so guarantees have been given to small and medium borrowers right maximum number of credit given to retail and services now you may ask me right so what does this do even with borrowers who have a high probability of default the loss given default is zero with 100% guarantee right so then any rational economist or student of economics would ask then there is a huge moral hazard problem why should i repay my loan if my loan is guaranteed by the central or state government and that's the catch the npa experience of public sector banks based on the data shared by the ncgtc right was much better than their overall npa experience so it is not that 100% guarantees or credit guarantees spur moral hazard and loan default right 
So based on this, we have these credit guarantee schemes and based on these credit guarantee schemes, right, there has been a sharp growth in MSME credit over the last two years, right? First on the back of ECLGS, next the revision in the CG CGT MSC, right? Now, why do you need a new model for MSME credit? This is a little theoretical, but across the world in many developed countries, right, bank loans are what you call negatively assortative. That is, good banks make loans to poorer quality borrowers over whom they have control, from whom they can extract higher rates when these borrowers return to good health. In countries like India, due to high monitoring costs and lack of collateral, we have what you call positively assortative matching. Good borrowers find it safer, better, right? The monitoring costs are lower, the search costs are lower to lend to large borrowers. Hence, the Honorable FM, who released our reports on ECLGS, she has suggested that Indian banks should develop their own models to assess MSME credit, which should be very different from those that they use for large borrower or other borrower credit. So this is an important announcement, right? Though there is no allocation, this skill is of vital importance. Now, what is in it for banks? Today, there has been robust credit growth to the tune of 17.4%, close to 18% year on year, right? Deposit growth has lagged behind. I'll come to that later. As a result of which, there has been some stress in the retail segment, right? Uninsured loans, so therefore unsecured loans, credit card outstanding, the latest financial stability report highlights some stress even in the resilient retail segment. It makes sense at this point for banks to diversify towards MSME credit. One point which is overlooked in MSME credit, and I come from my background in liquidity risk management, every such loan is associated with a current account deposit. These current account balances are treated at par with retail deposits. They're treated as some of the most stable liabilities that a bank could have with very little chance of premature withdrawal. Many of you may have heard of the Silicon Valley Bank crisis in which 85% of deposits were wiped off by wholesale depositors, bulk depositors in two days. 9th and 10th of March, 2023. These deposits, so MSME borrowers can not only give them higher interest income at lower credit risk because of credit guarantees, could also provide them with stable liabilities, right? Hence, the emphasis on MSME credit, right? Market borrowing, right? So. Fiscal deficit at 4.9% of nominal GDP, right? The, as ma'am said, the glide path of borrowing would be slower. Borrowings are set to reduce. Another point, right? Reduction of one lakh crore in borrowing through tables. Why is this important? This is important because if the government borrows less, why is this important for the financial sector apart from fiscal resilience? If the government borrows less, short-term and long-term risk-free rates fall. As short-term and long-term risk-free rates fall, so we expect a reduction in table rates, we expect a reduction in long-term yields on dated securities because of lower borrowing, as a result, ladies and gentlemen, right, the rates at which corporates borrow, right, the rates at which banks borrow today, 
That's what I told you. I'll come back to it because deposit growth is around 11%, while credit growth is around 17%. How do you finance that excess credit growth? Through market borrowing. As a result, right, <coughs> CD rates, certificate of deposit rates, call money rates have all shot up, right, from the levels in March or April 2022. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if you can slash the risk-free rates, those rates are also expected to soften, right? The other macroeconomic advantage is that in that case, as rates soften, corporates do not have to increase prices to meet their bottom lines. As a result, inflationary pressure also softens the Reserve Bank of India is under no pressure to raise policy rates. This is an example of fiscal monetary policy coordination, right? Right. <clears throat> Direct taxes, right, I'll not speak of indexation. There has been a lot of discussion on that. Short-term capital gains, taxes at 20%. Now, sale of options and futures, let me take a minute. Sir, am I within my time? Yes. So, sale of options and futures. So when you sell an option, right, you are responsible to buy back at a given price when prices fall. So when you sell and you get a premium, this is like an insurance contract, you expect prices not to fall. God forbid if prices fall, that paltry premium will be useless. Your losses are unlimited, right? And that is what the SEBI chairperson and the governor have been harping on again and again and again. On 19th July 2024, the RBI governor expressed his fear that the youth, that the ordinary person is investing his savings, right, in capital markets, right? This fear about futures and options has been expressed by Madam Madhavi Puri Butch, the chairperson of SEBI. So this not only fuels speculation and an artificial bubble in capital markets, this also erodes savings, right? Once these prices drop once the market corrects, right? They face a double whammy. And what is more alarming is what ma'am started with, the share of liabilities to GDP. So therefore, the sinister possibility with which I want to end are these investors, retail investors, borrowing to invest, right? And that is why you have these taxes, right, so that they cannot exit early, so that the rate of growth of these markets, right, slows down in an orderly fashion. This is what you call a Tobin tax. Okay. Sand in the wheels. Yeah. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sanjay Bosu. I think towards the end he said he's supporting SGT. So he supports the sand in the wheels. Uh, so I, I'm tempted to give the score. Uh, I think it's 4-1, Professor Hari. We had, uh, anyway, we have uh, limited time, so we are going to open it straight up, straight away to the uh, audience. Uh, I request you to, uh, can we please have the mic uh, and quickly to go to the, to the audience people. Keep your, if you have a question, keep it very brief uh, to the point, and we will collect a few questions, and then we will ask the panelists to respond. So uh, can you just stand up? I'll, I'll repeat your question because by the time the mic gets to you, it's it. Uh, good evening to all the panelists. My name is Kabir. I'm pursuing my master's in public policy. Uh, again, my deepest gratitude to all of you for having this panel. My question is directed towards Professor Hari since his areas of interest uh, are uh, political economy. Uh, my question is basically since when, till when is Till when are we as a country supposed to adhere to this 
concept of fiscal consolidation or fiscal prudence. Okay. Till when are we supposed to just, uh, and there's a little follow up as well. No, 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 one, please, please. We have five, six hands already going up. So your question is about the timetable for fiscal consolidation. Timetable, yeah. not exactly, but basically uh, there has been a detachment from the uh, Washington consensus. And now till when are we supposed to possibly like adhere to this? You are a student of Gokhale, so you'll have plenty of access to Mr. Hari for the next right. two years. But anyway, please keep your questions, but don't try to smuggle a second question. Uh, requesting panelists to note down the question, we'll collect all of them. Yeah, the one, the gentleman in the, in the front is, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Vansh. I am a student of MA Economics at Gokhale. I just joined a week ago, Gokhale Institute. Okay. And my question is related to agriculture, so I think it would be Apte. ideally, yeah, Professor Apte. So, so <clears throat> you talked about the Food Corporation of India. In the 60s and 70s, we had a green revolution. Well, the FCI played a huge role in us maintaining our food security. And now that we're transitioning into the second phase of, uh, you know, expanding our uh, primary sector, where there has been a lot of talk about on uh, doubling the farmer's income. And there were, you know, initiatives for market reform, for credit reform. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, they couldn't work out very well, especially the credit ref the market reforms one. And post that, the government has, uh, you know... <coughs> Anj, question, you please. Can say, speech or sorry, sir. <laughs> please ask a question. Uh, would you say that the government now has misplaced priorities by introducing the Kisan Samman Nidhi scheme in place of, you know, maybe relying on credit reforms and market reforms more Okay. for the okay. second phase of yeah. agriculture development. There's that uh, lady at the back, Specs. At the back, can you please give? At the back. Yeah. So please collect your questions, yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Arya. I'm a final year BSc student of economics here at the Gokhale Institute. My question is regarding MSMEs. Uh, delinquency rates for banks, private banks providing loans to MSMEs is much lower than public sector banks and uh, uh, NBFCs. Uh, along with that, uh, considering that credit demand has grown by 33% and supply has grown by 11%, do you think the dashboard idea is sufficient enough to combat the information asymmetry, uh, the fact that there is a lack of credit in the economy, uh, as well as the over 39 million MSMEs in India who rely on only informal sources of credit? Okay. okay. We'll take one more question, we'll take qu answers in one more round. This uh, per person in the front, next to Kabir. Take the mic, yeah. Good evening, everyone. My co uh, <coughs> I have a comment to make, then there is a question. No, 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 please, please, no comment. Badme, we'll have a break. Uh, question, please. Yeah, so uh, in the budget, as well as in the economic survey, there is one repetition that the uh, inflation is in control. So my question is, since December 2022, there have been six time revision of the repo rate, and even now, there is a uh, there is a constant repo rate. There is uh, there is no revision downward. So how can we say that the uh, inflation rate is in control? Okay. Uh, okay. Where RBI is where, where yeah. RBI is not confident that as the consumption revives, yes, yes, yes. they can be again. Uh, Got your question. So that will be for uh, Dr. Rupa. So can I just ask each of you to give the brief answer? Yeah. yeah regarding the timeline or the schedule for the fiscal consolidation, the immediate target, the short term or the medium term target is going to be 25-26, which has been mentioned in the budget itself, to consolidate the debt because, uh, because as I told in the earlier also, it depends upon two parameters basically. One is the growth rate of the economy, how fast economy is going to grow, as well as the how better you are able to control your interest rate or the future liability part of it. So there, that is where we need to have a long-term policy roadmap. I'm sure that the 16th Finance Commission is working now. So I'm sure that within a span of next one year, they are going to come up with a long-term or a medium-term kind of a roadmap for the fiscal. Normally, they, these finance commissions do come up with a roadmap for fiscal consolidation. So we may have to wait for a year to see what is going to be the long term. Because ideally, India's system historically has been 60 percentage is going to be the ideal scenario where the 40 percentage is by the union government and consolidated state government is going to be 20 percentage debt. 
<coughs> the question is asking too many things. Uh, to put it simply, the nature of reforms that we have attempted, mostly on paper, uh, they could not be translated into uh, reform functioning of a sector. Uh, for majority, major bl uh, blame of that sh should be at the doors of the state governments uh, because they are, they are the ones who happen to have the nature of machinery that you require. Union government doesn't have much of a machinery and handle over it. As a, uh, and what happens in the public life, uh, and economics cannot miss that public life, there are certain kinds of things that become too popular, and they become a popular slogan. To use the term popularized by Amit Shah, uh, there are many pe people who can make such kind of jumlas. Uh, for example, uh, Swaminathan made many jumlas in the report that he wrote, uh, which were quite nonsensical, by and large. Uh, like uh, this, this C2 concept plus 50% return on it. Should be assured. How? From where? But you express your wish, Vidyartha doesn't have limit, okay? and Adhyartha doesn't have power, then what do you do? So if nothing else, at least you try to uh, soothe on the feeling by making a direct transfer. Instead of making it in form of credit, the so-called loan melads or uh, whatever kind of hidden subsidies, I didn't talk about this. When you talk about the uh, electricity subsidy, fertilizer subsidy, because they are given in the name of farmer does not mean it accrues to the farmer. Like tax incidence, the subsidy incidence is also different. Where it is applied and where it is declared, that's not where the incidence occurs. So in that case, the better solution would be make a direct transfer, and that has been tried. In other words, this is one of the very uh, naughty, uh, both KNOTTY as well as NAUGSTY, uh, problem of uh, Indian policy making, that uh, union government and state government are not necessarily on the same page on variety of issues, particularly the pace with which and the kind of institutional formats that they need to actually adhere to or change, there is no consensus. In agriculture, when they say there is no consensus, means we say we have disagriculture. So Arya's question, uh, Arya's question, uh, MSME, she says that it's uh, the actual problem with credit is the huge gap between supply and demand. That is, deposit growth is slow and credit growth is high, not just the dashboard. Your comment. I think there are two points in it, right? The first one, very well caught that the credit growth for MSMEs is a lot larger than the overall credit growth, right? There are two things happening in it. One, the MSME growth is good. Second, very interesting thing is informal credit moving to formal credit. So that's a wonderful thing happening. That's one part. The second part, you mentioned the dashboard. The dashboard is for overall monitoring of announcements for any government uh, any time. Specifically for the credit issue to be resolved, there are the two numbers that I mentioned. If it's about 20 odd trillion rupees, credit gap, 15 to 20 trillion rupees. On the other hand, the game institution GAME has come up with this report of 10.7 trillion rupees is the delayed payment issue. If you solve the delayed payment issue by connecting GSTN platform with the trades platform, trade discounting would happen substantive part of 10.7 trillion dollar issue would be resolved i think that's the solution R sorry apologies rupees rupees apologies if anything professor basu wants to add to it yes so that is why i feel that the lenders right banks and financial institutions that is what madam sitaraman has made clear they should develop their own capability so now it's a rising tide, credit growth is high, right? You lend to MSME on the back of high credit growth. What if there is another crisis like the pandemic? At the onset of each crisis, the sector to suffer the sharpest decline, first of all is MSME. That is why these are complementary, you know? So you, this is a whole package of initiatives to activate any particular sector. You have credit guarantees, you have internal capability at the bank level, then MSME deposits are preferable, right? That's what makes the entire sector attractive to banks. 
Um, about inflation, um, you, you see everything is relative. When we say it is under control, uh, before inflation targeting framework was introduced, uh, inflation was sticky around 8 to 10 percent. Now it is hovering between, you know, closer to 5 percent. And that also we find on the higher side because our chosen range for uh, to tolerance level of inflation is between 2 percent to 4 percent. And within that, the core inflation, which defines the demand pool component, it is you now, it has crashed to 3 percent. So point is that the, uh, the fact that RBI raised a uh, repo rate, uh, you know, between 2022 and 23, eight times, and uh, you know, kept a tight leash on liquidity, increased the risk weights uh, for overheated sectors. All that has led to this. But point is that you know, risks to inflation will always remain. As you said, you know, tomorrow if there is a uh, consumption revival or uh, if shocks coming from external sector or food sector, those risks are there. That's why they have to be vigilant. But point is that they don't want to kind of hastily now, uh, uh, you know, start reducing the uh, policy rates just because it has come down. The fact is that the last leg of disinflation process is always very sticky. And if prematurely, if they do that, uh, there could be a, uh, you know, bandwagon effect of that action. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rupa. Actually, uh, to be fair, she did say in her comments that while the overall inflation rate has been a very good performance, but uh, there is some element which is food inflation, she referred to it as being very sticky and it continues to be high. Uh, we can run the fiscal deficit as high as we want, but we cannot run the time deficit. So unfortunately, we have run out of time and we cannot borrow time from tomorrow. So I think uh, using my privilege as chair, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to also mention to Professor Pradeep Apte, he said that the budget discussion is most useful to government servants mainly. Sir, I want to tell you that we have some 17 government officers watching you and monitoring you. These are all people who are going to make the union budget in the future. They are Government of India officers from the Indian Economic Service. So please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> we are happy and privileged to have them in campus this week. Uh, and I hope you are having a good time. Uh, there, I'm not going to try and sum up because we have had a very rich variety of halwa and other snacks. Uh, I hope they, they have uh, sort of... Uh, whetted your appetite or a tingle, uh, little interest. Uh, for example, we had, uh, I was trying to keep score, but I'm not going to, Professor Ari, no more score keeping. Uh, we did have, by and large, you know, good macro backdrop, but micro story is worrying, whether it's jobs, whether it's private investment, whether it's agriculture problems that was after mentioned, or most importantly, Hari kept on saying, that our fiscal situation is not comfortable at all, and we have to worry a lot about it. At the same time, the contradiction irony is that at the state level, we are under under leveraged. We are not using the fiscal space. So this is our, India is always a you know story of contradictions. And uh, MSME, you know, we uh, our champion of MSME is here that uh, we feel we keep on saying there are seven seven crores, seventy million, eighty million enterprises. Uh, contributing to almost half of industrial output, half of exports, half of employment, but not even getting 20% of the credit. So this is a big area of, uh, and to that extent, it's an inclusive budget. The fact that we talk a lot about MSME, we talked a lot about education, skilling, training, it's a very inclusive budget. So we must give, uh, I mean, credit for the, for where it's due. And one budget doesn't make a big difference, but it, it sets the direction. So I hope there's enough for us. And sir, we will actually have an, a discussion on the economic survey, as, as you suggest. So we will, that's also an important document. Uh, one thing uh, in conclusion, I must say that big things which, you know, I think Mr. Girbana said, what did the budget not speak about? See, the very big thing that's going to happen in a couple of years since uh, Hari mentioned 26 as the glide path. In 26, we are supposed to do delimitation. So there was no uh, mention either in the economic survey or in the budget speech. Not that it's part of the budget making, but that's a big event coming up and it will have some impact on the economy. Second is the census. That 2021 was supposed to be the census. Now it's 2024. I don't think it's going to happen in 25 as well. I don't know whether it's happening in 26. So, uh, and the census is a very big national exercise. It has, uh, it has expenditure implications. So I find that two or three things were not mentioned, maybe, you know, we'll see them announced uh, separately outside the budget. 
So I, on that note, I want to thank all of the, on behalf of Vishal also, who, who was supposed to give a bit of thing, but I'll take, take over from there. Thank you to the organizers. There are a lot of organization goes behind this. First of all, our co-sponsoring co organizations, National Institute of Bank Management, Pune International Center, along with the Oakley Institute, we have hosted this event for the ninth time. Uh, the, the IT team, the admin team, uh, the PIC team, uh, and of course the logistics team, the publicity team, the PRO, uh, uh, so, and members of the press who are here, and most importantly, you audience who, who sat through this, so thank you all very much for making this uh, event a success, and I hope you will uh, have some more occasion to chew on the budget a little bit more. So on that note, I think we'll call this uh, end of the session. Thank you. Thank you.